It is wonderful to have you all here that this opportunity of thinking for three days or something like that uh, about why this that we write, how do we write, etc., etc. So when I pose this question in my introduction, uh, why do we write? In the scientific pursuit, if you do not write, you might as well not have done it in many ways because communicating science is so absolutely essential part of what we do. Communicating science means not only that you will, as you said, put it down as a repository. That's not communicating, that's storage. Communicating means actually successfully passing it on to somebody else. We'll talk about that, who somebody else should be, etc. But it really is quite important to recognize that without communicating science, the whole process of the scientific endeavor would be stalled. And while it is certainly conceivable that you could say, well, look, uh, it's still fun. Let's just do it for the fun of it. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it won't proceed. It won't pro there won't be the process of scientific growth, progress, etc. But you know, that's the very idealistic. And there's lots of other reasons that one should be thinking about. Uh, why should we write? Uh, it, in the end, if you stay in this career, or if you stay almost in any career derived from the training that you receive as a scientist, you need to communicate because in the end it will be a metric. It will be a measure of what you have done. The oral tradition is great, and sometimes that communication is fantastic, but it tends to be ephemeral. And the lasting communication is the writing. And the writing is essential. You will be measured by it, so you might as well do it well. So let's talk a little about the sort of things that one writes. So I've got here two small works of scientific writing. One of them is Newton's Principia Mathematica, 1686. The other one is Darwin's Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection, 1859. Now those are remarkable in the sense that they have withstood the test of time. They have been highly influential. And everybody, I doubt too many of you have read Principia Mathematica. Maybe our colleague over there who's an engineer has. Many of you may have actually read Original Species last year because we were celebrating, after all, 100, 150 years of its publication. How many of you have read Original Species? Show of hands. Excellent. So, Actually, it's interesting because one can actually critique it as scientific writing. But in the end, the weight of what was being presented in these particular cases can in many ways said to overshadow the clarity of the writing style itself. They've become really quite, quite classics. But are they really the ideal examples of writing per se? The reality, now we have to sort of be grounded, chances are that none of you in this room, none of us in this room, will write this type of contributions to scientific knowledge. In fact, I will even dare say, that's not exaggerating, I don't want to take credit away from any of you. Maybe some of you will do it, I'm just saying chances are. Chances are that nobody alive today will write one of these contributions. Most of us <laughs> will have to be writing things that are contributions of a less of a lesser magnitude, which means even more important that the way you communicate it be absolutely crystal clear and phenomenal because stuff that doesn't stand out by any means, by all means, better be beautifully presented. And that's really what I want to uh, talk to you about. The reality is we have to ask the question, how is our writing? How is our scientific writing doing? So, you might suddenly answer that question. As a person, you might say, geez, you know, I do not have enough papers. I've got to write more. My writing is too slow. That might be the personal perspective. My perspective, I'm a little older than you guys, most of you guys, is, geez, you know, there are way, way, way too many papers. And the sad part, and I have to say this because I'm a firm believer in it, the vast majority are rather bad. 
I, I think that is very, very sad that such a wonderful discipline as a scientific pursuit is represented by communication that by and large is bad. So what is wrong? What has gone wrong? And I think what has gone wrong in many ways is that we don't really have a metric. We don't have a great way to measure good or bad writing, quality of writing. And to try to make the point about this, let me make uh, uh, an analogy or use something else as an allegory for what might have gone wrong. OK? Now, I love to run. I love to run. I seem to always have loved to run. So I'm going to use running. And I'm going to use the metric of running to make an analogy here. So when I think of running, it's speed. And it's very easy. The metric of running is you go fast, you go faster than the other, you win. No, no complications there. And so here's, here's this wonderful example of somebody that went really fast. So this is Usain Bolt. How many of you guys watched this video when it happened? Okay. If you didn't, you missed something phenomenal. So this was at the Beijing Olympics. And Usain Bolt had just broken the world record in the 100 meters by many steps over his number two. But what was amazing about that race is that he was looking back. You can see it in the picture there. He was looking back, laughing, having a great time, by the way. And he was criticized for looking back. Now, how can you fault the imperfect performance when he broke the record? How can you fault that imperfect performance? If he broke the record. So he may have a little fault. It's not the perfect uh, style, but he did it. In fact, the beauty of it is, a few months later, he didn't look back, and he broke his own record again in Berlin by another few tenths of a second. A remarkable guy. Here is uh, Haile Gebrselassie. Haile is a phenomenal marathoner. And he just broke the record also in Berlin a couple of years ago. Uh, two hours, three minutes, and 59 seconds. If you do not think that is fantastic, try running half a mile at that pace. <laughs> but you see, he also gets criticized because people say he wails his hands a little bit too much. But he's got the world record. And take, for example, Paula Radcliffe. Now, Paula Radcliffe is the record holder on the marathon for the women's. And she's, I think it's two minutes, uh, two hours, 15 minutes, and 25 seconds in London a few years back. Remarkable time, shattering, I think, the record by several, I think by a couple of minutes. And people also criticize her because she bumps her head too much. <laughs> Jeez, you know, these are the masters. OK, those are the masters. And so there are some people like Newton and uh, Darwin. They are the Newtons and Darwins of running. And maybe they don't run with a perfect style, but they do all right. The reality is most of us who run the marathon are in the pack. <laughs> and some of us do well, and some of us don't do as well. We're in the majority of people out there who don't win, right? Of the 30,000 people who run the, <laughs> the New York Marathon, 29,999, including Kara Goucher, will not win it. But there are still lots of things that they can learn. The problem is that if you don't run right, you end up like that. And I think what I want to make sure is that in your scientific career, you write in such a way that your writing doesn't end up like that. And there are things that you can do. That's why you're attending the Institute. In the belief, and the reason I'm, sitting, I'm standing up here, is the belief that writing can actually be improved. 